Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here. Lovely to be here in this wonderful institution that I could only dream of ever being able to attend. My experiences in education were to get turfed out of school at 16 years of age, which is not uh, the blueprint for anybody, but uh, it turned me into a, an, an idealist of the University of Life and School of Hard Knocks. So it's wonderful to be here. I've had a tour of the city. Um, many years ago, I had, and I'll, you'll get into this at some point, I had 250 retail shops, and one of the retail shops was in Oxford. I never saw it, but interviewed uh, John Major's son, James Major, for a job in it. Didn't get it. Maybe his father shouldn't have got the other job. That's a different discussion. Anyway, lovely to be here, and lovely to see you all. Well, it's interesting that you start with discussion on the School of Life. My first question yep. for you is that you began your career setting up a pocket phone shop it and quit, yep. expanded very quickly. Mm -hmm. What did you learn as an entrepreneur that you've used going forward? Well, I think you learn many lessons. You know, <laughs> success is something that people attribute to people and don't understand the background behind it. Success is like an iceberg. You only see the top of it. The bigger part is failures and mistakes that you've made. And in order to be successful, whoever it is, whether you've had friends like mine, like Theo Pafitis that have been here and spoken about his successes, or you talk to Alan Sugar, or you even talk to people like Zuckerberg, they'll tell you about the successes in life, but they'll also tell you about the failures. Because it's important to be able to learn lessons. Most people that have been successful and had success, and I've had both, I've had great success. I built a business in five years, sold it for the best part of 100 million quid when I was 31. And I've also lost vast swathes of money. And I've had business before that that were unsuccessful. Now, there's a mantra that I don't subscribe to, which is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, you know, the next person that says that to me, I should probably punch them in the face. But the, the, the reality of it is what it does do is it gives you experiences and it gives you an outlook. But the things that I learned about being successful is if you want to do anything in life, I know there's, there's some, been some controversy with influencers talking about it's the same 24 hours in a day and everyone can do it. But I came from a background, it wasn't particularly wealthy. My father was a printer that worked on Fleet Street, so I had a union leader mentality. My mother was a beautician that worked in Vidal Sassoon's, so she had a sense of style and awareness of the world. And I came from a background of A, a union leader or a union person, but B, me having an outlook of meritocracy. So I believe that the fastest route between A and B was a straight line. And the only thing that could really stop me was my own ambitions and my own desires. I didn't achieve huge things academically. I'm not advocating that to be the way to go. Six or seven O levels, this is a time in education when O levels were the benchmark and there's obviously different grades and different uh, attainment levels that have become more prevalent. But I had a very strong belief in myself. Now, confidence is something that you either fake it to make it or you have it from the outset. I had a confidence and belief, and some might say it's because you didn't know any better. So when I talk about the idea of failing and, and, the, and, the, and the sentiment of um, what well, doesn't kill you makes you stronger, it does change your perspective, it gives you scar tissue and muscle memory, which maybe takes away some of the things that you might have done when you were younger, when you were braver. So what I had was an inherent belief, because if you don't believe in yourself, then others won't believe in you. And what you do to believe in yourself is you avail yourself of knowledge, you avail yourself of the subject matter you want to be involved in, you engage properly with what you want to do. If you do something, for want of a better expression, on the back of a fag packet, and you don't do it properly, then you won't get the right outcomes. Now, of course, you learn. You learn on the job. You learn through experiences. You've got two ears, two eyes, and one mouth. And sometimes you should deploy that logic when you're listening to people or seeing what other people do. But you also have to be brave. You also have to be strong. You also have to be committed. There is no antidote to hard work. There is no, you know, there is no uh, alternative to being committed to what you do. If you want to be successful, and success comes in all different guises. I've done many speeches over the years at good or bad times in my life to to when I bought the football club, when I was 31, I became the youngest football club owner in the world and it came with all the different baggages of being very young and very strong in my view. But I also had a vantage point of wanting to go around and talk to all the schools that I went to when I was a kid, some of them that I got thrown out of, 
um, and, and, and suggest to them that there really wasn't anything that you... No, listen, we can, without being disrespectful, you can't get a one-legged man to run a nine-second hundred metres. So I'm not going to take it to the ridiculous extreme, but you can always do things to the very zenith of your ability. And that's about being focused. And Gary Player, a famous golf player, once said about luck, because luck forms a part of success, that the harder you work, the luckier you become. So you apply yourself. You learn the industry that you're big, or, or, or the challenges that you want to be involved with, whether it's being an author. You know, when I wrote a book, I spent time with people that told me about the, 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 the first chapters that I had written that I thought were really rubbish, they told me I thought were really good, and they told me were really crap, and told me why, and told me how to be descriptive, and told me how to look at things, rather than talk about something very bluntly, describe it, make it flamboyant so that people can relate to it. But going back to your original question about what you learn, you learn to be fleet of foot, you learn to sometimes learn to, when to speak and when to be quiet, um, you learn to take good advice because ultimately advice is like backsides. We all have one and we can all give advice, but it's the right advice that you take. But I think it's more importantly, you look at whatever it is that you want to do and you look at it from every angle. There's a lot of things going on in this world. You know, we talk about what's going on with say the landscape around COVID, for example, and we talk about the modeling. There's a lot of controversy about the modeling that's being used to the way this country is being run, and it's the worst case scenario that's being used. And in business terms, whenever I embarked upon a business, I would write a business plan that had three looks to it. There was a realistic business plan, there was an optimistic business plan, and there was a pessimistic business plan. The pessimistic business plan went in the drawer, the optimistic went to the bank if I needed any help, and the realistic sat on my desk. And so you work to those, to those models, and you think about what you're doing, and you don't take no for an answer, you never let people tell you that you can't do something. You look at conventional wisdom and you see if it applies because the world is being disrupted by all manner of thinking now. 20 years ago, we would never have said that Amazon would disrupt the high street and the way that we buy things would be something very different to the traditional experiential walk into a shop and buy something. But you also have to be realistic. And I've never done, it's ironic, but I've never done anything in my life for money. And when I have, which is a contradiction in terms, when I have, it's never worked for me. I've always done things to be successful, to be determined, to be better than the next guy alongside me, to learn lessons, to emulate. Having lived in America and lived in this country, I enjoy living in America because the concept of, of what you achieve is based upon not where you came from or how you speak or what your background was, but what you can do. So I don't know if there's lessons in there, but the main focus for me was I was determined the fastest route between A and B was a straight line, as far as I was concerned, and obstacles were not things that you stopped at and used as excuses the reasons why you can't do something. They were things that you found a way through, over, under, across, or around. And it's those decisions that you make, because we'll all get opportunities in life, that will define the level of success that you want. And by the way, success isn't all about winning. Winning is about giving your best. And if you give your best in sports mantras, they talk about winners. Winners, in my view, and I have young children, so I speak the same way to my, to my, to my young daughter and my one-year-old son. So if I'm a little bit tired tonight, he's kept me up until five o'clock this morning, is about giving your best. And that will always be, you know, it's, it's a bit platitude-based, but it's actually how the real world works. So let's talk about your motivation for moving um, from your phone, phone shops yep. to... Crystal Palace, yep. maybe an unlikely change in direction. Mm. What motivated you to do that? Well, I suppose you could say a fool and his money are lucky enough to get together in the first place. Um, it was, um, I was very young and very confident. And when you believe that you've been successful in one industry, you think you can take those skills and put them into another. And you can, if you've got a big check, but you're prepared to learn in the same way that you learned the industry that you were successful in. I felt that football, my father had played for the team that I was wanting to buy. I had grown up supporting them, hundred grew up in a, in a little house 100 yards away from the stadium, and I felt that this was an opportunity. I felt that football would lend itself to my personality. I felt I had the strength of character to be able to do what it took. I felt that given my successes, uh, or perceived successes, because success is all relative, that there was an opportunity 
uh, in the sports industry because I saw the, the direction of travel. I saw that the broadcasters were starting their engines and I saw that football, soccer for, for, for any of our American friends that are in here this evening, um, was going to light it up and that there was going to be so many different associations and the broadcasters, as I say, were starting their engines. And I felt if I get this right, then I'll have an opportunity to, to build, in part of my thinking, was an entertainment industry, an entertainment business that involved other businesses that I got involved with, which was making films, a magazine that I owned, owning a restaurant group, and a few other bits and bobs. Like most things, you know, sometimes if you don't know what you're doing and you lead with your chin, it'll cost you a lot of money. But for 10 years, it was a, a labor of love. It then became just a labor. Um, and then it became something that I wanted to reflect. Uh, I wanted the reflection to be the one I wanted. It's a very difficult industry, sports. Um, and, and because I was so young, and at the time, I was probably not as calm, and I'd like to think as wise as I, or wiser, wiser now than I am when I was 32, 33 years of age. You walk into a ballroom, mm -hmm. and the average chairman, president, or owner is 60 years of age, and you walk in there at 33 years of age, you know, perhaps driving a Ferrari and smoking a cigar and thinking everything comes out of your mouth is important, you're going to find a few people that aren't particularly happy with that. But it was, it was a choice because I felt, hmm, I played football once, my father played football, sports businesses are interesting, um, there's an element of ego, when you buy sports businesses, you look at the people that own them, you read about them in the papers now, the Americans are buying a lot of sports franchises in this country, and I use the word franchise because they are becoming franchises rather than just community assets. And people buy it for the benefit of association, for credibility, for recognizability, for ego. Perhaps if you're Roman Abramovich, one of the most expensive life insurance policies, but you buy it for your own reasons. I bought it because I was motivated to be successful and I thought it was the next step. And there were successes and there were failings, but there were lessons. And it, and it took me on a journey of understanding what failure looks like because I lost a lot of money in it. And it shaped my thinking and it shaped and it probably matured me as a person because I didn't value money. And if you don't value money, but money shouldn't be your driver. It should be part and parcel of the recognition of success. If you're good at what you do, I've never met a successful pauper. So the, 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 the essence is to be good at what you do. F sports and specifically football in this country is a very difficult business, but notwithstanding it, it was something I wanted to have a challenge at. I believe that challenges are things that motivated me and I thought this is a challenge and, and it was a challenge. And as we see um, people from overseas buying into yeah. sports franchises, as you said, yeah. do you think that football fans still attach the same significance to club owners and managers? Um, and do you think that they attach maybe more significance to people like yourself who've grown up locally within the club? Well, the cook, the candlestick maker and the baker that used to own football clubs, a local businessman that wanted to ride around the town in their Rolls Royce looking good in front of their cohorts has gone because the scale of football has gone through the ceiling. When I came into to UK football, the best football club owners were the ones you never heard from. There was a book written by a famous uh, footballer called Len Shackleton that wrote a book saying, what do football club owners know? And it was three blank pages about football. And it changed because I wasn't prepared to be sat there like some ATM for footballers and football managers whilst they just spent inordinate amounts of my money and then told me to get on with the outcome. So I was very front and centre. So I probably changed the direction of travel for the profile of football club owners because A, I was very young and B, because of my attitude towards life, because of my personality, because I was very, I suppose, media friendly with the very strong sound bites and the manner in which I lived my life with it, who, whichever person was in my life at the time or whatever business venture that was always public domain facing, it created an interest. And then of course, you then see the level of financial opportunity in football. And it's now become, you know, in 1992, when Sky, as a broadcaster, invested in football, they changed the landscape. Then Roman Abramovich came over in 2004 and parked his Russian tank and sprayed cash around at everybody. It changed again. And then Sheikh Mansour changed it again by buying Manchester City, by just raising the bar. So multi-millionaires like me become waiters by comparison in financial terms with people that are have Middle Eastern money or nation-state money or oligarch money. So... 
I've, I've got a viewpoint that sports clubs have such a unique place in our society, specifically in this country, that it's almost an ideal that they should have blue plaques above the door so they should have a special preservation status because too often, too easily, they're used for the wrong motivations and they forget the core principles of what made a football club. I was up in Newcastle recently and you may follow, I don't know how much of you follow football, but there's been a very controversial takeover of Newcastle. I'm very much against it because I think the regime that's only Newcastle United are not the most edifying regime. But the former owner of Newcastle, Sir John Hall, who's a great man, 88 years of age, still going full tilt. And he talked about the value of sports clubs in the community because sport is such a, a wonderful thing for society, not just at excellent levels, at grassroots levels, because it brings people together. It brings a sense of community and value and competitivity. And if you compete in sport, you sometimes compete in life. And I'm not suggesting that the blueprint should be if you don't play sport, you can't compete in life. But there is a synergy about being competitive. There's also a synergy about a togetherness and a, a coherent spirit that sport brings. There's also the flip side of it. It's very tribalistic and doesn't bring some things that we're proud of. We saw some things in the European Championships in the summer that, that no one would be proud of, and that may well be reflective of the underlying current of our society for a variety of reasons. But I just think that there is a link that's been lost because there is no relation. Don't tell me that Sheikh Mansour bought Manchester City because he liked spending time in Moss Side, or Roman Abramovich was desperate to bowl up and down the King's Road. They bought it for their own motivations and their own reasons. Um, and it's, of course, changed the landscape and the finances and the economics of football have taken it further and further away from the fans. So you have to go down the pyramid. And the pyramid mean I, I mean the lower leagues in football to still get the value. But, but when you see when you see young kids engaging in sport and what it means to them, then you should get your responsibility as an owner. And I think most of us do, some of us don't, or most of us, me being, did in the past, but certainly most of us should, if we own football clubs, understand the inherent value of the uniqueness and the beauty of sports in this particular country. Do you think growing up so close to Crystal Palace safeguarded the interests of the club when you were owner, or was that motivation for you coming from elsewhere? No, I think it was incredibly damaging for me because, you know, quitting whilst you're ahead is not the same as quitting. And there was a time when it was right for me to leave the football club and stop writing checks out. But because I have a fool's integrity sometimes, I believe that if you take something on, you do it. And that makes me a, an easy person to deal with in one respect and difficult in another. But my responsibility, because I, you know, having grown up with this football club, having been a kid climbing over the walls on a Sunday afternoon with my kid brother, doing things in the stadium that I shouldn't do, I'd say it was marking my territory for years to come when I was going to own it. Other people might say it was breaking an entry, but that's a different discussion. But for me, it was a responsibility that I took on. And when you saw what sports does, and how it influences people, you should get your principles and you should get your values right. But on the flip side of it, there is also a side of sport that isn't enjoyable, that sometimes it's a bit like the curtain being pulled back on the Wizard of Oz, and you're sat there with some guy pulling all the bells and whistles, and he isn't really what you think he is. He's just somebody in a little room making a big noise through a, through a, a microphone. Um, so I, I don't know if that's an answer, but it's how I feel, how I felt at the time. And if I'd take me back now with all the benefit of experience, I probably would have, might have done it slightly different. And you spoke about how football started as a labor of love, yeah. became a labor. Yeah. Um, and you've spoken in, in the public eye about how you became yeah. disillusioned with it. Yes, I did, yeah. What was that process like as somebody that had grown up, your father playing for Crystal Palace, your brother as well? Disappointing. But life is full of disappointments. I imagine in the world that we live in now, there's plenty of people that have far more disappointing things than I have. You know, you wander around. I went to Poland a couple of years ago and walked around Auschwitz, and then you get context, okay? So from my point of view, it was disappointing. It wasn't what I wanted it to be. And when you saw that the very people that are supposed to work alongside you are the very people that often don't, you become disappointed. Um, and also, when I realized there was a ceiling, I wasn't going to be able to get Crystal Palace to beat Manchester United on a regular basis, and I wasn't going to be able to dominate football as I'd like to have done, it became something that I found arduous. And of course, when, it's, when you are commoditized as being a person that's only about money and your job, a good football club owner, 
really is to write checks and buzz off and keep his mouth shut. That's what they really want. What they don't want is people to challenge the status quo. And I challenged the status quo. I dispelled the mythologies. I looked at the nonsense and I battled with the system because I didn't believe that it was right. And a lot of the things I said were right. But the trouble with people like, like me is if you challenge vested interest, there will always be a situation where they round on you. So for me to become disenfranchised, it was a disappointment, but life is full of them. And then it's about, okay, this isn't what I want it to be, so how do I try to make it what I want to be, or how do I try to live with the responsibilities that I've taken on, at the same time as maybe find, maybe find my satisfaction somewhere else. Hence the reasons why I went into launching magazines, or building a restaurant group that I wanted to build, or looking at one of your former guests, myself and Theo Pafitis, building a nutrition business, or looking at the film industry, all these easy industries to make money in that I felt were really sensible bets. So from the point of view of, of leaving the football club, it was a phase in my life. It was a learning curve, it was expensive, and it was a challenge. But it also gave me an opportunity to look at the media world, which I didn't really like and didn't really respect. And I have very strong views about the media because I think one of the most divisive things we have in this country is our media. I think 24 hour rolling, rolling news is one of the most evil creations that's ever been laid at our doors. And I think some of the problems we have in this country are laid firmly at the door of mainstream media, which is ironic because I know that I'm doing some work in the media, but it's never about being in the media. It's about how you operate whilst in it. So it, it took me through a journey and it's about what you learn on the way. And an entrepreneur, there's two kinds of entrepreneurs. There's inventors there's people that, are, that can see opportunities or there's entrepreneurs that see something and make it better. I was an entrepreneur that didn't invent the wheel, but tried to make the wheel better. When I started my mobile phone business, I had been involved with a company called The Car Phone Warehouse, who you guys will all be familiar with. My business, you may be less familiar with, but if you walk around seeing a T-Mobile shop, every T-Mobile shop was one of my shops. I worked with The Car Phone Warehouse for, uh, for six to eight months with Charles Dunstan because I'd lived in America. They had done a deal with an office superstore called Staples, who were an American business, and they asked me to get involved because of my understanding of the American psyche. Six months in, I thought I could do better than those guys, and went off and built my business and the challenges that went with it. And, and it was all about, as I say, about finding the mechanism to be successful to the level that I wanted to be. So I don't know what point I'm making there. I think I'm making a point. Maybe I'm making it to myself, but I think it's all about the challenges that you take on. How do you choose now what kinds of things you want to invest in? You've gone into various think, range of things. I think you invest in people. You know, I listened to, to I listened, to, I watched the rerun of Theo being here, um, and I turned down the first series of Dragon's Den. I thought, I don't need that. What do I need that for? It's a crappy show on BBC Two, gonna have no listeners right? or no viewers, right? I'll do one on ITV, that's absolutely crap. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and of course, I watched Theo talking about the investment criteria for the Dragons. And it's very much that. People of any substance and sense invest in people. You get good ideas, a bad person, right? Get a mediocre idea with a good person, you'll be all right. Um, and it's about, I've always invested in, in things that interest me. Um, I'm not one of those where there's muck, there's brass and grind it out. And a lot of my mates, are, you know, one of my best mates, um, a guy called David Tabazil, who by the way, you guys should have here because he's a bloody genius. Um, he founded a, a tech bank called Derlicker, founded Demon Internet, founded Autonomy, founded Video Jug, been involved with businesses that have built net worths of about 40 billion. And he does things like stay in his lane. Theo stays in his lane and deals with retail. I'm gonna stay in retail. I'm gonna run Ryman's, I'm gonna run Robert Dyer's. I'm a little bit more of a champagne person. I like to get involved with very challenging projects that have great risk attached to it. And that's a different dynamic, but if it's got good people, I like it. So I tend to look at projects that motivate me and inspire me and engage me. Um, but I also am very relaxed these days. I'm not chasing things. I'm enjoying doing the media. And the media suits me because whether I like what the media is or isn't, it is an influencer. And if you can use that influence well, I, I've sort of been dragged into the media kicking and screaming, into the sports media, in a space, what sells in life, what makes money in life is scarcity, right? And I operate in a space, there aren't many Premier League football club owners, there's about 80 of us since the history of the Premier League, right? I'm one of 80 Premier League football club owners, so I'm in a unique space that I can talk about the industry of sport very differently than anyone else can. So what I do is I sit in this space and I look at the media world and I've never really had the will to do much more than have a bit of fun with it. 
I'm now looking at it saying, well, I don't think Joe Rogan's that great. I don't think Joe Rogan signed a deal with Spotify for $100 million. And I think I can do better than that. So now I've got the will. So now I'm looking at the way. And, and I'm looking at media because I know I'm content. Good content and bad content depend upon the listener. But I'm content. So I now, I now want to own that content. So I'm now looking at a space. I thought that media was just words, but words change the direction of thinking. We've just seen someone stand up in the House of Commons and recant a speech given to Neville Chamberlain in 1939 about, for all the good you've done, your time has come, stand down for God's sakes, man, and we'll probably see a prime minister fall on the back of words like that. So words are influencers. So I'm now beginning to look very clearly, because I've had film companies, I've made films, good films and influential films and interesting films and successful films and unsuccessful films and I've made theatre productions. Now I'm looking at the business more of how can I influence through the media. So that's my next direction of travel and it will centre narcissistically on me and we'll see how that goes. Let's talk about your career in the, the media from the yeah. beginning if you don't mind. You sure. started as a columnist and yes, you I ran did. into some controversy at that point. Of yeah of your career, you were charged by the Football Association. I was, yeah. Well, I wrote articles for The Observer, um, and I wrote articles about sport and about how sport was really held together. See, people don't like the truth. They only like their version of it. And there's, a, there's an alternate version, which is the real truth. And I spend my time with journalists who often don't know what they're talking about. So I wrote articles that were very strong, very strident, and very honest. And of course, it brought me into confrontation. And at the time, I really didn't care. I, I was quite happy with confrontation and I still am a little bit like that. I think there's nothing wrong with confrontation because it provides a spark, it provides thought and engagement and it gets people's creative juices working and it also makes people work bloody hard. Why should people dial it in? Why should people get away of saying something and not being held accountable for it? Me too. So I used to write these articles in the Observer and of course it then put me on a direct collision course with the authorities. And I spent my life being in collision course with various authorities, being told what I can't do and what I can do, and then saying, oh, bloody, we'll do it my way. Sometimes wisely and sometimes unwisely. So I started writing for The Observer, which was great. I had a limited amount of time to want to do it. I did 15 columns and that was enough for me. After leaving football, I decided to write an autobiography. Um, and ironic, you know, this will, this will give you my view on sports. The book was called Be Careful What You Wish For. So you can draw your own conclusions as to some of the journeys that I might have been on. But I wrote a book about my experiences in sport, my experiences in life, my experiences in businesses, my attitude towards life. It became a bestseller, which was great and very flattering because there's nothing more flat. And I wrote it. I didn't get it ghostwritten. I wrote 132,000 words. And after it had been reduced to get rid of the swear words and legal read, it was OK. It was down to about 125,000. And then the opportunity came about, I spent a lot of time in Spain, had a property company over there building some properties, a little bit boring. Uh, and I came back and I was approached to go into sports media. And the best sports media around is a broadcaster called Talk Sport. And I've spent the last two or three years taking it more and more seriously to the point now where arguably, some may say differently, we have the best, most listened to radio show. We're probably the best content. Um, and so I'm enjoying it. And I think it's, it's nice to be good at things but I paid a lot of money to learn my trade and talk about the industry that I'm in. So I talk about it from a very different view. And I confront the, 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 the world with experience of having done it. So when we talk about strong issues in sport and we confront things like racism, or we have the players taking the knee and we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement finding its way into sport, or the players believing that they're taking the knee to eliminate racism from sport. And yet I owned a football club in one of the most multi-ethnic um, parts of the country with a multi-ethnic team and representation wasn't something I didn't want. It just wasn't something that was unavailable to because the communities themselves weren't engaging. And that's not racism, that's just something different. So I talk from those points of view that engage people's thinking and you've got a narrative in this country, you're watching it through the mainstream media, you're not hearing what you should be hearing. You're not being told certain things and you're seeing alternate news platforms pop up like GB News and you'll soon see uh, Talk TV that's being set up by Rupert Murdoch. Now I know Rupert Murdoch will have his own way of doing things but you're gonna see news challenge what's going on and I think we have a right and people should have a questioning mind and work out what's true and not be force fed a way to look at the world. 
and the BBCs and the ITVs and the skies of the world have, 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 have waged a campaign that we're living through of fear, fear, doom, doom, and more doom. And I personally don't like that very much. And I think there's an alternative way to look at the world, an alternative way to look forward. We have a generation coming behind this that people have a responsibility to. And the generation that's coming, this generation, your generation, have a, have a, have a challenging world, but have a world full of opportunities. And I think there's going to be some interesting changes and some interesting landscapes. So from that point of view, the media world interests me and engages me, but only, and the beauty for me, is I'm economically set, so I can say things in the media without my career being determined by a cancel culture or a mentality of people not liking what I have to say and finding a way to deplatform me. What do you think we should be asking for from major media outlets now? Integrity, honesty, a lack of bias, balance. You know, I've sat on, I've done shows, I've done questions, I won't do question time because it's crap, it's nonsense, it's binary, it's rubbish, and I won't sit on a, I won't sit on a panel with low grade of politicians that shouldn't be in these jobs because there's no benefit of association to me and I don't want to demean myself by sitting next to somebody that shouldn't be in a job. And our politicians aren't being held to account. Where are the great interviewers? Where are the Brian Waldens of the world? Google him after you've listened to this. That we used to interview prime ministers like Margaret Thatcher and ask them questions. Where are our leaders? We live in a country with a vacuum of leadership because people are too... The fourth estate has got too much power. It's got too much influence. And I know why that is because social media has started the trend and the mainstream media is colouring in the gaps because it needs to keep up. But we should be expecting more. When you watch, whatever your persuasion, whatever your views on Brexit were, right, every single panel that was convened on the BBC, you'd have three Remainers and one Lever. And that's not, and that's not a fair balance in a discussion. And the BBC's persuasion was to illustrate a certain view. Now, everyone's entitled to their view, but it's also entitled to be debated properly. Why don't we have proper debates about the landscape of what we're living in? Why aren't we talking about COVID properly and the experiences that we've had, whether it's vaccines for young people, whether it's natural immunity? These conversations get shut down and people get deplatformed and they get vilified. And why? And why should they be? because it doesn't suit certain people's narratives or it doesn't suit the agenda of vacuous leaders that don't have the courage of the convictions to really lead and to really be an example to take the next generation with us and all the achievements that the next generation will have in a tech world that's going to change the way everybody looks at the world. Look at the world. I remember selling mobile phones 25 years ago where the concept of talking to someone was to call a kitchen wall. That's how you, you wanted, to, you wanted to speak to someone, you called a kitchen wall, you know, or you got a payphone and arranged to meet your mates somewhere or another. Now, you know, everything you do is done from a mobile phone, and not even I, that sold a million of these buggers, have, uh, uh, envisaged that mobile telephony would be what it is. So you guys are the next generation that take it, but you need to have people that facilitate that. And our politicians tragically think they're pop stars and think that what they have to say has any substance, but they don't have the substance because they don't have the courage of their convictions. And you came into media from a different point of view. Yeah. What have you learned from being in media compared to, I suppose, doing the sports and, and what you've been talking about before? What have I learned from the media is that it's, it is an influencer. And whether I like it or I don't, and I, and I, I am very fortunate that I work for a broadcaster that allows me great latitude fortunately for me, um, and I'm also able to argue my way in and out of very controversial subjects that most people find as taboo. You know, whether it's policies around political landscapes, whether it's the thing I touched upon earlier on, the situation around race in this country, because I want to question, I think we should have a thirst for knowledge and we shouldn't just accept what people tell us. You know, whether we, people make the accusation about institutional racism and someone makes an observation about it and tells them that institutional racism is represented by more black uh, uh, women dying childbirth. And I want to know what's behind that statement and question it to understand why that thinking so I can learn and I can and expand my thinking. But what I've learned with media is that it has influence, but it needs to change and it needs to change dramatically because it's disingenuous and it's dishonest and it's biased and it's disappointing and it's full of very average people that are nicking a living that don't have the courage to do anything meaningful but also it's polarised by people's persuasions. There's good in there and there's going to be changes and when you see people, whatever you think of people like GB News 
I'm a little bit biased because my partner is a broadcaster on GB News, but I see some of the good in that platform. I see some of the crap on it as well. And I also see the challenges that are coming for the mainstream media. I don't like the fourth estate running this country. I believe it should be run by those that are put in to run it and not newspapers and not influencers. So my, my journey through the media is not to take it too seriously, not to take myself too seriously, to, to be honest and to be brave, even in the face of not of not necessarily conforming to the public narrative or popular narrative, not doing it just to get clickbait and to be to be centre of attention, and to try and to, in my little field, which will move from sports into societal, into economic, into political, because that's where I want to go, and to have influence in there, is to tell people something they didn't know, but also to be honest and to give people an opportunity to see things properly, rather than through an agenda. And I think the media can do that, but I think there has to be better controls over certain aspects of it. Well, it seems like the perfect time for me to open up to the real interviewers, our members, but I'll ask one thing before I do. Yeah. What's next for you? Yeah, I was talking to, to Tom on the train about that. I'm very relaxed about it. I have a beautiful one-year-old son, and I want to see the world I, through his eyes a little bit. So I'm happy with looking at media, looking at the content opportunities that exist for me, and maybe taking him to a few football matches and seeing what he thinks about what his dad once did. And maybe another book. That's what I'm potentially working on. Great, I look forward to it. Um, do we have any questions from anyone here? Yeah. If you just wait for the microphone from Mar. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Uh, thanks, Simon. That was absolutely fantastic. So thanks a lot. It was a real pleasure to listen to you. I'm just to introduce myself. I'm Daniel Harris. I'm a second year history and politics unit at Worcester College. So I just want to ask if you, and Crystal Palace aside, because I know you love them, but if you look at the 20 Premier League clubs now, is there one club that you look at and you think organisationally and structurally they're very well run and they're a very professional outfit and you think, you know, I'd love the opportunity to own them at some point other than Crystal Palace. Thank you. Well, it's a, I suppose you look at it from a different perspective. You can look at new additions to the Premier League like Brentford with Matthew Benham having built a club with the money ball mentality of looking at quality of player against cost of player against points per, per, per pound spent. You look at Manchester City and say, well, they win. You look at Liverpool and say, heritage, livery, spend pattern, spend lots of money, but recoup a lot of money, spend 150 million pound on players, but having sold Philip Coutinho first for 150 million, so their net spend is very, le is very little. It's, it's difficult to say I admire anyone. I've never really spent my life admiring people. I've never had any role models. I've had people that I like and like to listen to, and we're all guilty of that. We like what someone has to say, so we like them, right? And we agree with them because they agree with our thinking. Um, and I've never been a great admirer of the football world because it is sometimes when you pull the curtain back, it is a banana republic sometimes. It's held together by gaffer tape and bullshit um, and money. Those are the three biggest, three biggest, two biggest commodities in, in, in sport are gossip and money, and they go in equal measure at times. But I suppose if I were to look across the, the lexicon um, of sporting clubs in the Premier League, I'm not going to give you a Premier League club answer. I'm going to look outside of the Premier League, and I'm going to go down the pyramid and say, if I'd have bought a football club in the north of England, and I have to be very respectful of the north of England because my son was born in Hull. I wasn't happy with that, but he's born in Hull, so God's country, God's country. Um, and you look at clubs like that and you look at clubs like Sheffield Wednesday and you go, wow, look at the potential and, and, and the energy that those fans. In London, it's a little bit like, well, I can go to the football, I can go to the ballet, I can go to the theatre, you know. In the north of England, with no disrespect or profiling or idea of levelling up, there's a real passion and a football club really does represent the cornerstone of the community. So somewhere like a Sheffield Wednesday or once upon a time a Leeds United, which was a football club that whenever my team played for them always scared the shit out of me because it was such a big club with big fans. So uh, it's an answer. Any other questions? Yeah, the member in the brown jumper. Uh, hi, Simons. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to have you at the Union. Um, I've got two questions, but they're somewhat related. So one, you mentioned being on a journey through life and that you've had a myriad of success and failures. So 
how did you deal with the difficult times, the times where um, you weren't as successful as you would have liked to have been? And added on to that, did you enjoy the process? Um, I'd like to give you the Rudyard Kipling answer, that I treated both imposters the same. Um, but I didn't. I took um, success in my stride and failure quite hard at times um, because it wasn't something I wanted to have. Um, and, uh, and I looked at it objectively. It depends what kind of failure you, you get involved with. The successes for me were a natural progression to what I was building towards. I didn't start something so I could fail. So when I was successful, it, for me, with my personality, it was, okay, I've got here, I've got to get there. Okay, I've got there, I've got to get there. So now I'm here, I've got to get there. And each one was an assumptive close on my perspective. And by that I mean, I had done it in my mind by conceptualizing it. So when I did it, actually did it, it was a given to me. And it was always chasing something, which makes you not appreciate. And because I was much younger, I didn't appreciate it. And I, I look back now a bit like, without getting too um, prosy, I look back like the character out of Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption, wishing I could talk to myself at a time in my life saying, well, Jesus, Louise, appreciate that for that moment in time. Look where you are. You have just won the Premier League. You just won the playoff final to get into the Premier League against all the odds. Enjoy it rather than think, what's next? What's next? What's next? Um, what was the second part of your question? Uh, did you enjoy the process? Did I enjoy the process? Well, I think the answer is in the same, in the same vein. Um, I, my, the happiest time of my life was building towards success never the success. It was always, always the hunt, never the kill. Now that's not an adage I would advocate because you really do need to take those moments. And there were moments. And I think life is about finding, without getting too um, verbose, is about finding contentment in whatever you can find contentment in. And I can remember twice in my life being contented. That's pretty pathetic. And I can remember where I was when I was contented. So contentment is the thing that you're chasing and whether money or success brings it to you, I didn't enjoy the process enough, and I should have enjoyed the process. It's not a regret, because you do what you do. It's a scorpion and a frog. You are what you are. You know, you can't unwind it. The very things that you do define you. But I wish I'd enjoyed the process a little bit more, because, hey, 31 years of age to make 100 million fucking quid, and it was all mine, and I can do what I want with it. Excuse the language, but that's a place to be. And I could have gone on and built other things. But, but I enjoyed a lot of other things as well. And I enjoyed, the biggest enjoyment I got was the difference it made to my family and to the lives, to my parents and to my siblings that I could securitize, give them opportunities and make sure their lives are better. And there's something to be said for that. It's not me living vicariously through their happiness, but it was something that I gained more satisfaction from than buying nice cars or buying nice boats or living in big houses or traveling first class. Believe me, those things are nice too. <laughs> um, from the member in the black coat just here. Hi, Simon. Um, do you remember back when the sort of Super League thing happened? Yes. Uh, Steve Parrish, someone you were speaking very highly of. I don't. Um, but go on. <laughs> we're, not, we're not Sky Sports. He stole my money. <laughs> and he basically said, uh, he was asked about the Super League, and he basically said, well, ideally you want the six clubs back because we kind of need them. Now, as a Villa fan, I wanted them kicked out because obviously that'd be no good for us. What would your response been? It's a fact of life. I mean, unfortunately, the biggest opportunity for... I believe that the football world should take control of its own destiny and not be selling its rights to the broadcasters. It's a proven concept. Build your own platform, deliver your own content because you've got it, it's your content. Market it, do a Netflix model, get 100 million subscribers, charge them 10 quid a month, you've got a billion and a half a year, right? Or actually 10 billion a year, rather than seven billion every three years or eight billion every three years. The challenge is, is that the next territory that's making money for the broadcasters because the domestic market is tapped out there's too much churn, too much competition, too much piracy. Piracy exists because the price point's too high. People are taking IPTV and models like that because they don't want to pay the price point. That's dangerous because behind piracy is organized crime and we don't want that. But the price point's driving things. The next, the next landscape is the overseas rights. And the overseas rights are not bought on watching Crystal Palace. They're not bought on watching 
Brentford. They might be bought on watching Aston Villa when Aston, Aston Villa rock and roll with Steven Gerrard, and that might well be the case. But right now, it's Liverpool, Man United, Man City, you know, Chelsea, Arsenal, and Spurs. Right? What they tried to do was not wrong. The mechanism that they deployed to do it. Why would you want to give your money to corrupt, divisive, disreputable organisation like UEFA as if they're some sort of standard bearer? They're not. And neither are FIFA. There's more corruption in FIFA than there is in Worm and Scrubs. But the bottom line is, is that they established the mechanism they used, which was no meritocracy, stank. They should have done it better. And for those guys that got off a seat to start a fight in boxing terms, the bell rings and they sit back down again. It was pathetic. They even want to have a fight. The real reason is JP Morgan didn't put enough money up. But that's a different discussion. But it has to happen because you cannot, the train has left the station. You cannot stop these players getting paid the kind of money they're getting paid. And it won't stop when you've got, you know, oligarchs and you've got Middle Eastern nation state money that doesn't care. They've got their own reasons for earning a sports business, whether it's sports washing or whatever it is. They don't care. And the, the, and the governance doesn't have the balls to securitize it. So Parrish was right and wrong. And he's a smart guy. We don't get on because he took something that belonged to me. But that's a different discussion. But he's a smart guy and he talks about things in a smart fashion. And so would I if I'd made more money out of a football club than I made it anywhere else. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, we'll go for Tom and then the member at the back after that. Just here. Thanks. Hey, Simon. Um, so... One of the characters in, in life right now currently is Donald Trump, and he's a leader. He's quite often controversial, and he speaks his mind. And, and you, I'm not saying you, you two are the same, but quite often you'll speak your mind, what you always do. What are some of the lessons that we could learn in terms of leadership? Because lead, real leadership, whether people think they're right or wrong, is a, is a rare commodity. And also um, in terms of the media aspect. So he handled the media in many ways, because it was kind of him against them. You've had similar situations. What are some of the, the lessons that you've, you've noticed from him? And also another question, second part of that question, would you ever consider running for political office here in the UK? Um, uh, as you know, I met Donald Trump very, very briefly at a boxing fight many years ago. He's a very engaging character. And I think he was a revelation in lots of ways. There was lots of toxicity and lots of stuff about Trump that wasn't right. But what he did was he broke up the political bullshit in America and dusted these politicians that were career politicians that nicked a living, that thought it was an easy darling, and he broke the mold because a commercial man, the world turns on money, and Trump understood that, and he's a deal maker and a deal doer. He was elected via media, via social media. And so he was a leader. I, I don't think some of the things, I don't think his demise at the end was right the way he handled himself. I don't think that the media were fair, but if you're going to constantly keep spitting in the eye of CNN or whoever else it is, you're going to find yourself foul of it. But I think he brought about a real sea change in the thinking around politics because we have career politicians in politics. And I know this sounds like a particular hobby horse, but when you hear, we don't have the best in class. Politics is a big person's job, a big girl's job or a big boy's job, not a rank amateur's job. And when you listen to people that are in power positions of authority, none of them are particularly competent. They talk about the idea that they get paid 80 grand a year and that should be sufficient. If you want the best in class, you've got to pay these guys proper money to get them in the door in the first place to make big decisions. And I watched the other day on Question Time, a Scottish National Party member talking about how everyone should be able to live on 80 grand a year. Well, I looked at your background, you were a researcher. You've now gone from 40 grand a year to 80 grand a year, so you think all your lotteries have come at once. But you need real people at the top of their game. And if you get somebody that works in industry that's on half a million pounds a year to come into politics and you only pay them 80 grand a year, they can't live, they need a second job. And this is why Boris Johnson's bang in trouble, because Boris Johnson decided to back Owen Patterson rather than be a leader and tell him to sit down, shut up, take his medicine and get back into office in 30 days time. And we now find ourselves on the precipice of a, of a world of problems, not just because of that, because Boris has done some silly things. But leadership is about really, you've got to pick your horses, you've got to pick the people around you. You're, if the only person you can point to in a room for a good idea is yourself. You're going to run out of ideas soon and you're going to be unsuccessful. So you need to surround yourself with good people, but you need to lead and you need to be courageous. For me, going into politics, I've lived an eventful life. 
And I think the events in my life might find me, find, find me having trouble with certain sections of the media who would love to have a go at me because I spend my whole time in the media having a go at them, telling them all, but I know nothing, bunch of nitwits they are. So it'll come my way. But to be able to effect a change, there's a part of me would like to, but I look at the landscape and I look at these politicians, and I look at the system and the rigged system that it currently is now, unless you're gonna change the system from first past the post to proportional representation and things like that, it's, it's gonna be always difficult. I don't hold the values. I've never voted for a party. I've voted for a policy and a leader, which means I've voted for Labour and I've voted for Conservatives. I've never voted for the Lib Democrats because that's a wasted vote as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, the, but the political landscape interests me but I'm getting to a stage in my life where I'm probably getting too old anyway. But I watch it with a great deal of interest. I've got a partner that stood two or three times in elections and I watched the wonderful experiences she got with some of the people in momentum in labor and some of the abuse that she took. But that doesn't, doesn't mean it isn't to be done. So I would never rule it out, but I don't see it as something that I'm aching to do. Hi, Simon. Um, thanks for coming to talk to us today. Um, you sort of had a, you talk about, you know, money makes the world go round. And to take it back to football, you had a quite sort of a 10 year period where money was so much on the rise. Could anything have been done to stop what has happened now in terms of the amount of money in football? Should anything have been done to stop the amount of money that's in football now? Effective leadership. Um, how, could, how could that have been done? Well, you know, if you look at the FA and you look at the people that purport to run our sport and you look at those guys that are often there for the wrong reasons, you need serious people to do serious jobs. And whether sport is considered to be serious or not, if you're in that world, do it well. If you look at the gap between the Premier League and the Football League, it was allowed because the Football League had rank amateurs that were not capable of doing their jobs. When you look at the advertising of the Premier League, it's bells and whistles. When you look at the advertising of the Football League, it's an old geezer with a rattle. Right? It sort of epitomizes the mentality. But the Premier League, they're powerful. Um, with the ownership models that have come in play, there was always going to be challenge, but it needed to be done properly. There's nothing wrong with the talent getting the money, but sports should be run in a way where it is economically viable. And it's not economically viable, it's, it's lunacy. You're getting footballers getting paid 400,000 pounds a week, and you're getting surgeons that do something really meaningful that are getting nothing like that. And I don't like to do the analogy between what a sports person gets and what a person in everyday life gets, but come on now. And these players think they're getting underpaid. But the scale of the opportunities there, if you look at the Spanish, They've changed their system and they're prepared to make the big clubs in Spain suffer for the time being, Barcelona and Real Madrid, just so they can get the system in order. A lot of that's to do to react to Paris Saint-Germain and the Middle Eastern money and to deal with Sheikh Mansour at Man City because they will just, they have the cash to turn your lights out. But it needed effective leadership. Like we needed effective leadership for the last two years and we haven't had it at times. And it, 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 I, I am many things, and lots of things about them are wrong, and some of them are right. And I think you have to be definitely in your life, definitely right or definitely wrong, ideally definitely right, but definite all the time. And too many people flip-flop, too many people don't have the courage of their convictions. It's a word that I've used many times in this time that we've been together. But it's, a, it's, it's real, because leadership isn't easy. It takes people that want to be to have the bravery and to have the commitment and to have the honesty and the integrity. And those are the cornerstones that make a leader. And too many people play at things. And the football guys play at it. They're more interested in what it looks like than what it takes to get it done. And we're in danger of losing aspects of our game and aspects of sport in this country because of the lack of leadership. And when I sit there watching it, because I've done it, I've done it, I've sat in a room with these people and I've done it. It's disappointing. And people like me probably won't get an opportunity because I frighten people, because I will call people out and I will fight with people to get what's right. And there's not enough people wanting to do that in our politics, in our everyday lives, and in our sports. Thank you so much, Simon. My pleasure. We'll it's finish like a bloody igloo in here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's got mugged by a polar bear on the way in. We'll finish with the question that we've been asking all of our speakers. Yep. If you could give our members one thing to take away to think about this week, what would that be? Um, if I could give your, I think the future is yours. 
I think that you are in such a fabulous environment. I'm sure this is a sort of formulaic answer, but you have the opportunity to be whatever you want to be, whatever that is, and, 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 and never let anybody on any level tell you you can't do something. Never let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Whatever it is you want to do, we don't all have to make money. We don't all have to be um, politicians. We don't all have to be successful to a level where people bow and admire our achievements, but we all have to be honest with our lives and never let stop people stop you from doing anything you want to do because there are no barriers. I don't care about some of the stuff that you've seen in the media about this, this silly girl that was an influencer that made observations about her 24 hours the same as everyone else's. But in essence, she's right. You can do whatever you want to do in your life. You can be successful, you can be motivated, live the best life you can, be the best version of yourselves. Thank you very much for coming.